Okay, this video is called Pioneers in Neuroscience and Astronomy. <clears throat> and so what I'm talking about is parallels with these paintings to what's been figured out about the prevention of dementia. So first of all is a painting of Copernicus, and this is by Jan Matejo, the uh, Polish artist. And basically Copernicus was a Polish priest. Um, you can call him a deacon, whatever, but he was a Polish religious man. And he realized that the sun was in the center of the universe and not the earth. And that was called a Copernican inversion to see things in a completely different way. He hadn't figured out all the details of how it all worked, but he knew that the sun was in the center and not the earth. So that was a major step. And it moved us away from all the sort of craziness of the Ptolemaic system, which was useful enough to navigate with for its time. The next picture here is some examples of you know, how the epicycles of the Ptolemaic system were very confusing. Um, the other point I wanted to make about Copernicus is his equivalent in the study of dementia prevention would be Jack Delatore. Jack Delatore wrote the book uh, Alzheimer Turning Point. He's the one who tied off the carotids and the mouse arteries. What I'm getting at here is Delatore's theory, it's brilliant. It makes sense. It puts you in the right frame of mind to think intelligently about what causes dementia and how to prevent it. And all this epicycle nonsense, this is like the beta amyloid theory, okay, with, and phosphorylated tau. This is all the nonsense that's been going on for many, many years, and all the drugs, none of them work. They don't do anything useful for the patient. Billions of dollars thrown in the garbage can studying beta amyloid and tau. That's not the point. They don't cause dementia. They're related to it, but they're not the issue. You can't get anywhere with beta amyloid and tau. Okay, I say this because... You know, all these people, they waste all their time. The patients get no benefit. It doesn't empower you at all. Uh, well, very little. The beta amyloid and tau stuff. And the whole concept of Alzheimer's, just a distraction, leads you into nowhere. That's like most of modern medical research. It's just a big waste of time. It doesn't go the right way. The right way is to sort of like understand what's happening. The next thing I wanted to talk about is um, a lot of the great scientists who've done great work. Okay, uh, let's see if this will get in the right spot now. Oh, I guess got to pull back here. Okay, so this right here is a painting of Johannes Kepler. And Kepler, you know, came after Copernicus and he did a fantastic uh, job of, you know, figuring out that you don't need the epicycles. And I just want to show you some things about him. You know, he's another astronomy uh, great pioneer. He lived from 1571 to 1630. And like I said, Copernicus figured out the sun was in the center, but didn't do a whole lot of other stuff beyond that. Uh, Copernicus figured out the planetary orbits were elliptical. Epicycles were not needed. But I also, one thing too, I, the point I would make is that science comes from Christianity, specifically from the Catholic Church. And if you study history, that is totally obvious. And the reason is that, you know, the Bible-based worldview tells you that man is created in the image of God, therefore he can be a creator like God, that the universe is rational. And because it's rational, it's worth the effort to try to understand it. Um, there's a lot of other cultures, especially a lot of these Eastern religions where there's no God or this concept of Maya where nothing is knowable. And that leads you into what's the point in studying. And what I've also seen is if people are too materialistic, they only want to make money and just try to have a decent life for themselves and their family, then they've got no inspiration to try to pursue higher learning and things that are more just abstract, okay? Because I know tons and tons of high IQ doctors, and most of them could care less about any type of theoretical scientific knowledge, okay? And I can also tell you that a lot of the doctors I know is just sort of do your job, make your money, go home, live with your family, okay? Have a decent life. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's normal. That's that's a normal way to think. But what I'm trying to say is if you ever want to create anything artistic or scientific, like make a discovery, you have to have these philosophical ways of thinking to motivate you to do that because you have to give up tons of other things in your life, okay? It's kind of funny, but that's true. <laughs> um... Uh, I, I was about to say something funny, like one of my kids said to me, I won't even go into it though, um, about, they told me, you know, why do you do all this academic scholarly work? Why don't you just uh, go do these other uh, fun things that I'm, I'm not even going to mention them. All right, so anyways, here's Kepler. And I just want to share with you some quotes from Kepler because it'll, it'll give you insight into his mind. For many years, I wanted to be a theologian, but now I see God is praised by my work in astronomy. 
Science is the process of thinking God's thoughts after him. The laws of nature are within the grasp of the human mind. God wanted us to recognize them. He created us after his own image so that we could share his own thoughts. I am merely thinking God's thoughts after him. The chief aim of studying the external world is to discover the rational order. So he believed that a rational order was there and he just had to find it. Okay, Kepler continues, and the harmony imposed on it by God, which he reveals to us in the language of mathematics. The wisdom of the Lord is infinite. The heavens declare the glory of God. It does not matter if my book finds its reader in a hundred or even a thousand years. Has not God himself waited 6,000 years for a human mind to be capable of gazing on his celestial spheres with understanding? Johannes Kepler. Okay, so what that means is because Kepler knew he was onto something good trying to understand God's creation, he didn't care if everyone else misunderstood him. And you have to be a lone iconoclast in order to be willing to pursue these ideas, okay? In the real world of science, like like I said too, I liked sports a lot better than science because when I played sports as a wrestler, everyone told the truth, everybody wanted to be good, there was no BS, it was pretty clear the athlete wanted to win, the team wanted to win, the coach wanted to win, the fans wanted to win, and whatever it took to get better, you did it. Whereas in science, constant lying and BS and almost all the money is you know, handled by big corporations that just want to make profit, don't care about the patients, don't care about the truth. Nothing matters except make money for the big corporations. So what I'm trying to say is the people who are doing this beautiful individual creative thinking, they're thinking like Kepler, okay? And that's also why I say science will never get better. And the reason I use Kepler as an example here is he's an example that tons of scientists make great discoveries in some narrow area, okay? And um, so he would be like, you know, like Blaylock, like... Um, uh, you know, uh, tons, tons of these other scientists. I'm not even going to say all their names now. I can't even remember all their names now. But they've all made a lot of great contributions. But then what I like about Isaac Newton is he sort of put everything together. And it's not just Blake, like, like that last lady, Catherine Reed, figuring out MSG and food. And then it's also an excitotoxin, as John Olney figured out, as well as Blaylock, as well as Dennis Choi, as well as Matt, Matt Matson. There's tons of other ones as well. Okay, and then Isaac Newton. And, you know, call me crazy, but I think I'm kind of like Newton in the sense of he came up with a workable system that you could look at the field and you would have these fundamental laws, you know, let's say of physics, thermodynamics, that anybody could use them to do actual things, to build a building, to make calculations about uh, the basics of their field in engineering. Okay, so Newton had a real lonely childhood. His father died. His, his, his real mother abandoned him for a long time. And he you know, was raised by relatives. He was highly religious. About half of his writing was on religious topics. And also one thing kind of amusing, by dogmatic Protestant standards, he was a bit of a heretic in the sense that he didn't completely believe in the idea of the Trinity. He felt that Christ was not the equal to God. He was the Son of God, subordinate to his Father, and it was to serve as a mediator between God and mankind. So he actually had to kind of keep that hidden, and he had some colleagues who kind of protected him. Otherwise, he would have been thrown out of the university. All right, um, here's a quote by Alan Kors. Newton inspired the scientific community. Newton had shown that the universe was knowable. And Voltaire, you know, made similar comments like that. Voltaire kind of tried to deny some of uh, Newton's religious features, but um, he did promote his scientific work a lot. Okay, so here's some quotes by Isaac Newton. He who thinks half-heartedly will not believe in God, but he who really thinks has to believe in God. I have a fundamental belief in the Bible as the Word of God written by those who were inspired. I study the Bible daily. All of my discoveries have been made in answer to prayer. Atheism is so senseless. When I look at the solar system, I see the earth at the right distance from the sun to receive the proper amounts of heat and light. This did not happen by chance. Isaac Newton. Okay, and this is a painting of him at Woolsthorpe. And this was during 1665, the Anu Mirabilis, where he just went off to Woolsthorpe by himself uh, because of the the plague of that time, so he could just study, and then he, he figured out optics, he figured out calculus, <clears throat> he figured out fundamental laws of physics. So anyways, what I'm trying to say is, you know, my theory of neurovascular uncoupling <clears throat> is really an extension of the calcium hypothesis, and lots of other people had done all the groundwork on it before. I simply sort of came along and saw how everything was all connected to nutrition, to toxicology, to EMF, and all that other stuff. Um, so anyways, uh, 
hope you found that interesting or entertaining. But and then I also like to point to if you don't have Christian ethics, you're screwed. Okay, because if you don't have Christian ethics. There is no interest to help patients. There is no motivation whatsoever unless you care about that patient as a person. All the money just says, you know, run them through the treadmill, the, the, the assembly line, and make your money off them. And when whatever happens, it doesn't even matter. You follow the standard of care, it doesn't matter what happens to the patient. You can't get in trouble, and you get your billing codes. Go faster, you make more money. So I think you need these Christian ethics in order to reach out and do things beyond just living in a materialistic way, get your money for the day.